taken in the recent weeks uh, over both Saltese Flats and the Saltese Uplands. Uh, and I'm going to kind of narrate and talk about the, the property uh, and properties while, while we do that. And then we will transition and I'll introduce our guest speaker tonight, Chris Bond Sr. from Ducks Unlimited, uh, who is really going to share uh, some great maps in detail. I'm kind of the the high overview guy, and Chris is going to show some uh, some real great uh, project plans and and future uh, things that are going to happen out there. And then we're going to transition into a, a question and answer session. When you registered for tonight's Zoom with a view, uh, you were able to submit uh, a few different questions, and I've uh, I've got them here in front of me. And so I'm going to read those off to uh, to Chris and give him an opportunity to to answer them. So. It, uh, that's kind of where we're going. And my goal is to wrap all this up by about 6.50 and definitely uh, in this call before 7 p.m. So uh, that's, that's where we're at. I'd like to call out that there is a chat. Everyone's microphones are muted, but there is a chat bar over to the side. And if um, something comes up, uh, a question that, that you just think of in the moment or something else, uh, that is a place where although your, your microphone is muted, you, we can still carry on uh, somewhat of a dialogue this evening. So, um, and there are a few few guests on the call that if we really get stumped by a question, uh, have a lot of knowledge about this as well, and we'll unmute their microphone and let them uh, let them answer some questions as well. So, um, without further ado, I think we're going to uh, move forward with screen sharing the the video of the drone footage, and um, yeah, I'm going to kind of take you all on a tour of these beautiful lands that uh, INLC and others have been working to conserve. So, thanks so much for for coming with us tonight and joining. Sorry, while well, we rearrange technology here real quickly. Get the right YouTube video up. Ah, that's the right one. All right. Well, everybody, welcome to Saltese Uplands. This is one of Spokane County Conservation Futures properties, a very popular recreation area with hikers, mountain bikers, equestrians, and bird watchers. This 550 acre conservation area was added to the county list of parks in 2011. The county uh, acquired this following a bank foreclosure of the property where the developer had plans for 107 homes and an 18 hole golf course. Due to the conservation futures program, this land is preserved uh, and as a conservation area and it's open to the public for recreation. It's a beautiful place to go and walk around. The lands we are flying over in this video are owned by Spokane County and permission was granted by both the Spokane County Parks Department as well as the county water programs. So uh, welcome to the 400 feet view of Saltese Flats. This is uh, the flats. Mount Spokane and the Selkirk Mountains are off on the horizon line. Antoine Peak is in the midground, and that squiggly white gravel path you see down below here uh, through the marsh is a beautiful new, new trail that was added just last year by the Spokane County Water Programs. The land directly below the drone is all owned by Spokane County and managed by the water programs. This area was historically a lake, Saltese Lake. Uh, it was a lake up until the late 1800s, early 1900s, when a local homesteader named Peter Morrison took a decade and a lot of hard work to create a system of ditches, dikes, and levees to dry out the lake so he could play, plant his Timothy hay that he wanted so badly. This area is steeped in a rich history that dates back to before the Morrisons homesteaded the land. This historic lake, it comes from the name of Saltese, which is Chief Andrew Seltis of the Coeur d'Alene Tribe of Indians. The spelling of his name seems to change depending on which side of Idaho-Washington border you are currently on. North Idaho, it's a Seltese Way. You may have driven that recently. And here in Washington, it's Saltese Flats. Chief Saltese led his tribe for 37 years, up until his death in 1902. During his time as chief, he personally traveled all the way to Washington, D.C. to work on treaty settlements with the United States government on behalf of his tribe. He built a home on the west side of the lake, which now has his name, uh, and he owned a large herd of cattle and hundreds of horses. He was very rich in horses, according to the historical accounts. He also has many descendants. His first wife, Julia, died in 1867 after giving birth to 12 children, and he yeah. remarried the following year to his second wife, also named Julia, and he, they went on to have an additional 11 children. 
for a grand total of 23. That just blows my mind. Uh, in the in the late 1800s, just blows my mind. Um, he's uh, he, he, in 1877, he moved 50 miles south to near Desmet, Idaho, and he's currently buried there overlooking the Desmet mission. Uh, the open lands of Saltese Flats today are facing the encroachment of residential development. You can see some in the right-hand side of the screen as homes make their way down that hill, getting closer and closer to Saltese Flats. New yellow fire hydrants dot the landscape around these fields where future homes will soon spring up. Recent actions by Spokane County water programs to purchase these lands and improve the water storage capacity have protected the lands you see here from being carved into new homes. This body of water didn't exist, this one that's just coming into view right here, didn't exist until last summer when earth moving equipment dug through the silty soils that used to be a lake bed and made a deeper, more permanent water feature. The soils here are so soft that the excavator doing the work had to lay big telephone pole sized logs down and drive out onto them to, to stop from sinking down while it was working. Um, I can imagine the future scene of waterfowl swooping down and landing on this new created body of water. Um, it's truly a restoration project, you know, restoring this area to what it might have looked like 100 plus years ago. Um, and the plant, the county has plans to make additions to this compact gravel path that you're seeing here, this beautiful white, nice lined path uh, in the future. And right now they kind of ends there, but there's, there's plans to continue that. And it's elevated up out of the water. So it's a flat elevated walking path, really a great addition to this area. The trail system here offers rolling, easy terrain, as well as some heart pumping climbing trails like the one you see here. The Saltese Uplands trails climb just over 600 feet from the valley floor up to the top. And this trail runner is having a good time trying to get up there right now. These trails were well used before the arrival of COVID-19. And now the county is reporting a steep, steep increase in their usage in the past four months. Maybe more people working from home have just been able to add a little balance to their life by getting outside and exercising here. And if you haven't already, I invite you to treat yourself and go for an early morning outing or sunset hike on the trails here at Saltese Uplands. It's off of Barker Road in the valley. We'll show another map in a minute that uh, gives you a better, better idea where it is. Um, and the Saltese Flats area. Go see both of them. Um, if, if you've been recreating here for years, I encourage you to go find a new trail that was just built this spring called the Turtle Gulch Trail. It's not on many maps, but you, if you hunt around and know the area, you'll be able to find it. Uh, it, was, it was put in with hand tools by Evergreen East. Um, and speaking of maps, if you are out shopping at REI or the Main Market Cooperative, you can, or Ramble Raven, you can pick up our River to Ridges trail map that INLC put together a year ago. And this area is, is one of the uh, eight different areas that are highlighted on that map. So Chris Bonsignor will talk more in a few moments about the work planned in conjunction with Spokane County and the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy to improve the habitat in Saltese Flats for shorebirds and migratory birds like Canada geese, tundra swans, and trumpeter swans. But in the next minute or so, I wanna share a future vision for conservation corridor that starts here at Saltese Flats and extends through Liberty Lake Regional Park, which is right over the hill, uh, straight ahead, that green hillside, and then all the way up to the tippy top of Micah Peak. Currently there exists 5,300 acres of conservation lands here. And imagine the wildlife corridors, creeks that exist in that large expanse of conserved land. Places like Quinimos Creek, Saltese Creek, Elk Creek, they're all on that hillside you see it in front of you here. But what a dream to be able to hike from the valley floor here to almost a mile high in elevation above sea level. Think of all the changes you would see on that hike. You could witness the habitat changing, the plants, the temperature, all in one outing. And every spring, the snows melt at the top of Micah Peak and they run down through those creeks into this basin. They fill these fields with water, recharging our, our aquifer and providing the drinking water that we need so much. Um, I personally love to see the wildness that still remains here. The coyotes out on a hunt in the field, the elk traversing the game trails on Micah Peak. It's really a, a wild area. And it's also so rich in history, rich in restoration work, and it has a really great future ahead. The community has rallied around plans to locate an environmental community center here. Earlier this year, Washington State Legislature approved funding in the state capital budget. We're talking a large sum of money here to break ground on a brand new environmental learning center. But wouldn't it be great if 
you could have 12 miles of recreation trails and conservation corridor right out the front doors of this envir environmental learning center and a place where children could learn about the environment and the importance of clean water and become more aware of, of their community and what, what it, in, you know, the environment entails around here in the Inland Northwest. So I'm really excited that, about this environmental learning center that will, uh, will help connect these trails and will be a new building. So if you're, uh, if you're like me, if you're out hiking or, or mountain biking, uh, if, if going up 600 feet sounds like a little bit too much for you, have no fear. This road on the right you see here in this drone footage is Henry Road. And it offers uh, the entire area here can be seen from the windshield of a car on a driving tour. You don't have to get all sweaty and, and ride a bike or hike to the top to get a good view. All you need is a little gas in your tank, 30 minutes of free time, and just follow Henry Road around. It snakes its way around. And, and don't forget to stop and take time to, to park at the pullouts. There's a, there's a number of places you can park your car and really take in the expansiveness of this area. If you're a birder, don't forget your binoculars when you go. If you're a photographer, please take your camera, especially sunrise photos. Uh, we would love to see your pictures. The Conservancy would love to share your photos on our website, social media. Um, we love pictures of people like you see here, people out using the land. Um, they're personally my favorite, but you know, floral, fauna, all of it. Um, we would just love to get, get pictures of this area being used and, 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 and you know, uh, all the critters that live out there as well. So when I recruited Chris Bond Sr. to be our speaker tonight, I knew that he had the added benefit of being a homeowner in this basin. Chris and his family relocated here last year. Some people, you know, they take their work home with them every night. Uh, well, I guess other people love their project sites so much that they make it their own backyard. Um, but with these beautiful views come work. And there, you're seeing some work currently in this video here. Like the fact that daily, Chris has to grab his tape measure and head out into the field behind his house to this test pit that's been dug and measure the water table, measure how far down under the dirt the water is um, and take those measurements because they're very necessary for the next phase of work that will occur here in the coming year. This is exciting stuff and soon Chris will be able to tell us all about it in his own words. So thank you for going on that flight with me around Saltis Flats and Saltis Uplands. Um, it really is a, is a great place. So uh, now I'd like to introduce, and we probably need to unmute his mic too, but I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Chris Bonsignor. He's the manager of conservation programs at Ducks Unlimited. And uh, a couple of fun facts about him. He was born in Mexico and his first words were in Spanish. He went to high school in Bellevue, Washington uh, and uh, was raised in Bellevue, high school in Brussels, and then went to Texas A&M Galveston. So this guy's been around the, the, the globe uh, learning uh, most of his life. And he is definitely a bona fide bird geek. Uh, when you go on a hike with him, uh, be prepared to stop and, and stand still and let him glass things with his binoculars and then hear things like, wow, cool. And that's it, just silence after that. Um, he recently uh, added some goats, I believe, to his, uh, his farm uh, and, he uh, hopefully will be climbing Mount Baker in the coming months. So he's out uh, enjoying nature and, and getting to know the Inland Northwest really well. And I'm really pleased uh, that he was able to join us tonight and he's prepared a PowerPoint presentation. So we're gonna allow him now to share his screen with us, but, and I think we still need to unmute his mic if anybody has the ability. Yeah, I'm working on that and I'm not sure what's happening. I'm clicking repeatedly on unmute. Uh, so I apologize for that. Bear with us here. I'm going to stop the record. Doesn't. Uh, uh, it was attractive, I'm sure, to a lot of water birds as well as a lot of other uh, wildlife in general. So that's the vision. I want you to kind of hold on to that because you're going to see the sort of the transition of what was a lake to what it is now. And, and hopefully we're going to bring it back to something close to what it was historically. So again, as Todd mentioned, there was some draining of the lake that started in the late 1800, 1890s. And uh, it took these guys, this family, the Morrison family, somewhere around seven or eight years to dig all of the ditches to drain this lake. These guys were dedicated. And they used horse teams to create the drainage ditches that ultimately drained the lake out the north end. And the horses kept sinking into the mud. So they had to actually make special wooden shoes for these horses to be able to run these teams of horses and dig these ditches uh, for years. So try and imagine that. 
Um, that's how bad they wanted this hay. And the soil is extremely productive. Uh, if you can drain soils like this, um, if you've ever bought at the, the garden center, black gold potting soil, I mean, that's what this soil looks like. It's amazing stuff. So this gives you a sense for what it looks like, what it looks like more currently. These photos were taken a, a few years ago. The photo on the right is a, a low altitude aerial photo of the northern end of the flat. And you can see all of these linear features. Uh, and those are all drainage ditches. There's literally miles of drainage ditches in this lake bed. Um, that was the only way they could effectively grow a crop there. Uh, because of the, the size of the watershed and the amount of precipitation happening on Mica Peak and the surrounding ridges, that water all comes through Salty Flats. And so they had to be able to run that water and direct it to where they needed it to go. And that was mainly out uh, for them to grow a crop. So, the photo on the left is, a, is actually a ground photo of one of the major ditches. And, and there's a gentleman sort of in the mid picture on the left. Uh, and that gives you a sense for the, the depth and size of these ditches. Some of these ditches are very large on the order of eight to 10 feet deep and probably 15 to 20 feet wide. So uh, a massive undertaking to drain this lake. And despite the, the degradation of the lake bed, uh, and the drainage and, and the almost complete transformation from a lake to farmland, many years ago, the area was still recognized by many people as a very important opportunity, a very important habitat resource, and a very important opportunity to do some habitat restoration. So, uh, you know, you go back into the Spokane uh, Chronicle, Spokane Review and Chronicle, 1991, people were saying, you know, this is, this is a very important waterfowl area. Um, uh, many people identified that. And then more recently in 2004, Spokane County did a, uh, a planning effort where they identified storage, water storage opportunities in the county and the Salt East Flats was a, a, a identified as one of those uh, uh, excellent opportunities. Um, again, even in the drain condition, the area provided a, really incredible habitat for waterfowl. Uh, mainly they were foraging on the agricultural land uh, and they came in droves in the fall and in the spring and ate the leftover grain from these agricultural fields. Now, when uh, agriculture really ceased by and large, uh, and by that I mean the Timothy hay and the oats that were grown in the lake bed, when that ceased in the early 2000s, uh, reed canary grass and invasive grass uh, this very aggressive took over. That's the photo on the right. And the photo on the right is from about a year ago. So we went from having high value forage for waterfowl in these grain fields and Timothy fields to now an invasive uh, grass that was providing very little uh, wildlife value. So um, the, the degradation unfortunately continued up until very recently in terms of wildlife habitat. I wanna give you a timeline uh, that, that the uh, Spokane Environmental Services really kind of laid out in terms of their involvement in the flats. Um, and I have to thank Ben Bradabo with Spokane County. Many of these slides uh, that deal with the work that they've been doing, he put together for another presentation and including the photos. So thank you, Ben, if you're on. Um, but in 2009, they did a study looking for uh, places to store reclaimed water. And Salty's Flats was one of the, the top uh, options and the reason for that is that the wastewater treatment plant was up for relicense, and there was no guarantees that the county was gonna be able to put their treated water back in the Spokane River where it goes now. So they had to look for an alternative. And so, Salt East Flat seemed to set the bill. So in 2010, they purchased uh, some land from the Morrison family, about 350 acres, and made some additional acquisitions. And then in 2015, Ducks Unlimited used some grant funds uh, to purchase another 60 acres and uh and that is the one of the ones that i mentioned i'll talk in more detail about where we'll be doing some restoration so that put the the spokane county uh ownership at about 600 acres in 2015 so they own virtually half of the lake bed now uh which is a real feat others have tried ducks unlimited and, and department of fish and wildlife and others have tried to uh purchase parts of the lake bed before and failed so the county gets a big tip of the hat we're pulling that off because uh, it's not easy doing that kind of stuff. 
Uh, in 2018, uh, after a long planning effort by the county and their consultants, uh, they wanted to put in water control structures so that eventually they could control the water in the flat. And so in 2018, those structures were installed. And in 2019, as you saw in the video, some areas were excavated and some water features were put in. And there may be more of that uh, down the road, but the, uh, the other element that was really, really uh, cool to see was the trail. Uh, that you saw in the footage, and that is a, it's a great trail. When this uh, wetland basin is all restored, it's just going to be a beautiful hike. It already is, but it's just only going to get better. Um, some of the other benefits to the, the work that's going on here besides wildlife habitat is potential recharge to the uh, Spokane Valley Aquifer. Um, of course, that is the, the main source of drinking water for all of us on this call, or most of us anyway, that are local. And so the water that's stored in the salty flat, ultimately a portion of that we think ends up in the Spokane Valley Aquifer. Um, it also provides an amazing uh, community resource for public access and for education of school kids and others about the values of well and restoration and environmental uh, restoration. Um, and then it, it, there's always the possibility that some future time, Spokane County will use that site as a, a uh, area to store the reclaimed water. At this point, it does not look like that's going to happen, uh, but it could in the future. Um, so a little bit more detail in 2018, you'll see the map on the right. Um, I'm going to try and turn on my pointer because I think it would be really helpful at this point. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Awesome. I mainly want to point out all of the water in the flats hits a, a, a low dam or dike across this line that I'm drawing here. And that was constructed, uh, no one's really certain, but many, many years ago. It was probably part of the efforts to control the water in the lake bed and direct it around the, the active farm field. So there is a, a dike that impounds water to the south of the flats. And what the county really wanted to do was be able to control that water, much like the farmers did previously, but they want to be able to put the water uh, to restore the wetlands when and where they, and also drain those wetlands at the appropriate time. Uh, because many of the wetlands in these areas uh, are not permanent. They're not flooded year round for years and years. There's, there's a, seri uh, a seasonal cycle to some of these wetlands, which is actually very helpful. One of the structures they put in, one of the very important structures, was one here in the dike that allows them to divert water into this water feature. That's what this is. And then on down into the lower parts of the flat. Uh, the flats generally fall from south to north, so uh, higher here and lower in the north. Uh, they put in other structures to be able to bring water in from the west. And then they put in a very large drainage structure that impounds all of this area and they can control the, the elevation of the water across most of the flat from that single point uh, of management. It's a very important uh, aspect to have in this project. Um, in 2019, as I mentioned, they did the excavation and the trail was constructed. So um, they are making awesome progress. I think I probably have to uh, turn that off. Now I can't get my slide to move forward. Anybody have any ideas? Oh, there we go. So the third phase of the larger county project is really focused on restoring the vegetative communities that we think were there uh, in, in the past before it was drained. So the first step in that process is to control the invasive species that are in the lake bed. And the number one enemy is reed canary grass, you guessed it. Um, this is a very common invader of wetland basins uh, where the hydrology is temporary, it likes its feet wet, but doesn't like to be flooded. And unfortunately, a lot of the wetland basins around here are have that sort of hydrology. So uh, canary grass is a very common problem. And the first step is to really get that under control uh, so that we can bring the natives back and they don't have to compete with this very aggressive invader. Uh, part of doing that is to mimic the natural flooding that happened in the lake bed. And that's a really important aspect because we know that if we flood it at the right amount, the right depth, and at the right time, 
we can actually flood the canary grass out. We can keep it at bay. Um, and when we do that, what we also get is the native plant community that's been sitting in the soil in the form of usually seed um, and can sit there for decades. Believe it or not, you get that hydrology back and all of this stuff pops out of the soil. It's like the David Copperfield moment of restoration. It's like, poof, there's a puff of smoke. And now all of a sudden you have all these natives. So in this photo, by and large, what you see are native uh, wetland plants that were not planted uh, and came back after the large uh, runoff year of 2017 when we had a lot of flooding out on the flat. So this was great evidence to us that we were going to have really good, we could get that water management right. And then those areas where we're not going to be able to flood, we have to use other techniques, and that is to actively go in and plant species that we think will do well in that environment, and probably were some of the historical plant communities there. So don't worry, these trees and shrubs are not in trouble. We didn't put them in prison because they were bad. Um, this is actually to keep uh, mostly deer and elk and moose uh, out of these plantings because they can just absolutely destroy these plantings overnight if you don't do that. So. Um, in those areas where we're not going to be able to flood, we're going to go in and actively plant uh, grasses, forbs, trees, shrubs, uh, whatever is needed. I had to show you this photo because we were doing, uh, this is uh, on the left, Nikki fighting with Spokane County uh, Environmental Services. And on the right, Tina Blue with Ducks Unlimited. She's our biologist here in Spokane. And we were doing vegetation surveys on the county property in the flats. And it was absolutely a jungle of reed canary grass. I mean, this stuff was seven feet tall. Um, and I have hay fever, and I was in the middle of a, a massive hay fever uh, response. But uh, it was just remarkable how uh, suffocating this canary grass is. And very few wildlife live in it. Um, so imagine the flats almost entirely in this cover uh, made up of one species. And from a, a restoration ecology standpoint, uh, it's really kind of doomsday. That's exactly what you don't want. Um, again, I mentioned the water management, how important it is. This is that outlet structure up on the north end that controls the impounding of the water in the flat. And you can see how large it is. And the county is able to manage the water level within inches of elevation. And if you look over on the right, you see that map of the flats with all these various colors on it. We have topographic data in the flats that tells us exactly what elevation uh, we're at in these various areas. So we can go to this water control structure and set an elevation, and we know exactly how much of the flat is going to be flooded at that elevation. So that's what these various colors uh, indicate. The other aspect of it, um, and for those of you who have been out uh, on the Salties Uplands or around the Salties Flats recently, you probably know it looks like there's somebody farming again out there. And a lot of invasive species control uh, uses agronomic practices. Uh, we're going in and we're mowing. We're spraying herbicides where we need to do that. And we're tilling the, the soil. And the, normally we don't like to do those things. But we know that with reed canary grass, it is such an aggressive invader that if we don't use this uh, integrated pest management approach, um, we'll never be successful. We have years of experience doing this, and we've really found a very good formula uh, for controlling it. We've had, we've had very good success using this formula. Um, and basically, to sum it all up, if you've heard of the term, you know, kicking somebody when they're down. I mean, that's essentially what we're trying to do with reed canary grass is like every time it tries to get up, we want to knock it down. And if we do that for a couple of years, which is what we're in our second year now of doing that, we know that we're going to largely knock it back and we'll give those natives a chance to, uh, to express themselves and, and uh, establish themselves on the flat. So the center photo is from the flats, and that was in the wintertime or in the fall, so you can tell everything's brown. Um, and the photos on either side of it are from a similar site in, along the Coeur d'Alene River, where we started with the same place, essentially almost 100% reed canary grass. And within three years, we the photos on the left and right is what we saw. Uh, again, almost everything you see in those photos is, is native, and none of it was planted. 
Uh, we're talking dozens of species of native vegetation that all came up out of the soil or were brought in with bird, by birds and other animals or through uh, flowing water coming into the site. So it's really quite magical. And then again, where we can't uh, get that response from the soil seed bank, we go in and actively revegetate these areas by plant, by planting them. And you're gonna see some of this over the years at the flats, really we're most focused on that first step, which is get control of the reconnaissance grass. And then later this year, we'll kind of transition more into uh, the establishment of the preferred species. So. I wanted to reorient you because the next thing I'm going to talk about is the easement property, which again is that green outline parcel in the center, kind of the heart of the flat. Uh, and we're working with the Inland Northwest Lands Conservancy and a private landowner, and they're putting together a conservation agreement that the INLC will hold in perpetuity. Uh, the funding for the agreement, which or for the easement or agreement, uh, will be uh, will come from the RCO, the Recreational Conservation Office, and essentially what it does is it pays the landowner to give up uh, some of their rights to the property, and in this case, it's development rights and agricultural rights, and that way it allows us to do the restoration that we so badly want to do on this property. So um, we're starting with the photo on the left, which is the existing. That's an actual site photo. That's Brian Heck, our engineer um looking uh, professional <laughs> and, and on the right is what we want it to look like in about two to three years and again the right is an actual photo from another site along the saint joe that we did with idaho fishing game and again we started in with very similar conditions as, as the photo on the left and we ended up on the right so this stuff is all doable and uh i'm feeling very good that we're going to have a very good chance for success um I wanted to show you the, the plan, the habitat restoration plan. So the areas outlined in blue, the blobs essentially are excavation areas. And we'll excavate down two to three feet. Uh, so not very deep. Uh, we don't, again, we don't want deep water and we don't want necessarily permanent water to occupy a lot of these uh, wetland bases because permanent water typically is less productive overall in terms of vegetation and vertebrates and therefore for wildlife. Uh, the area is more in the brown or orangish color. Uh, that is where we'll place the material that we excavated from these basins, and we'll create what we're calling riparian planting mounds. And riparian just simply means areas adjacent to water. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, riparian is just adjacent to uh, water or wetlands. So what we plan to do with those areas is plant them with trees and shrubs and add a whole other component to the lake bed that isn't there now, or is there in very small, small quantities. The area shaded in green is, will be seeded with, again, a native uh, grass mix uh, and, and native forbs. And then I should have pointed out in the red, as you outline the parcel, that is also uh, the easement boundary. So this is about a 52 acre easement. Uh, and then there's an area on the right that is unshaded the the landowner has asked that he be able to plant uh, grains and other forage crops for wildlife and just leave them for the wildlife and so that was something that was accommodated in the negotiations to toward the the easement so he'll be able to go in and that's about a 15 acre area and plant oats or wheat or some other wildlife friendly crop and leave that for the wildlife so um that pretty much covers that one. This is a cross section of what one of those mounds will look like. And this is really kind of the engineer's view of a mound, um, very linear. It will be much more messy than this. But I want to give you the uh, idea of sort of what it'll look like. We'll have trees up on the top, have shrubs on the sides. And as we grade down toward the lowest areas, we'll, we'll be more into uh, uh, sedges, rushes, grasses, things like that. So there'll be a, a tremendous amount of diversity and habitat added by these features. And lastly, I want to cover uh, the what we're calling the kind of the Ducks Unlimited Spokane County track, which is the one that DU purchased, the 60 acre track. So that's in the lower right. And again, that one has been in Spokane County's hands since about 2015. We're doing a little different approach here because we have a ditch. I'm going to go back to my pointer. We have a ditch. 
uh, that runs right through the property. Um, this is one of those large ditches. So what we wanted to do was really slow the flow. We wanted to get that water through these wetlands. And so we're going to plug that ditch, which runs all the way the length of this property. And there is our, an existing old dilapidated water control structure there, essentially a, a screw gate there in this dike that I mentioned earlier. And what we'll uh, be able to do is create a, a shallow swale or channel down to these blue areas, which are the excavation. Um, and we'll be able to run that water through these wetlands and really filter out any pollutants that might be there, although that is not a big issue in the flats because really there's very little commercial activity happening anymore in the flats. There's not a lot of farming. There's really not a lot of um, uh, forestry happening nearby. So, but any, any pollutants in that water will be filtered out by these wetlands and, uh, and then the, the material excavated from the, these basins will again be create, uh, used to create these riparian planting mounds. So we have one sort of lone excavation over here that will be uh, down into the groundwater and be seasonal. So by summer, it'll be dry. Uh, these other areas will probably stay flooded a little bit longer, but will probably also mostly be dry by the end of summer. Um, and then all of the other areas have already been planted into a native seed mix. And we're, we're working on some weed issues on some of it, but overall it looks very good. Um, and then we may take some of the material excavated and place it along this sperm and also again, plant it with riparian species. So um, it should be a, a really neat project. Uh, we're all really excited to, to get on with the work. And th those two projects, the last two that I mentioned, this one and the easement restoration project, we have the permits in hand. Uh, we have a contractor hired to do the earth moving. And we're essentially just waiting for the conditions uh, to allow the contractor to get in and do the work. And as Todd mentioned, I'm going out, unfortunately, on a weekly basis and having to measure the groundwater. And, you know, it's rough duty, but um, what can I say? Somebody's got to do it. Um, let's see. I'm having that same. There we go. I have to mention some of the funding support that we're getting for this project or these projects. And, and primarily what I'm referring to with this funding is the, uh, the easement and restoration as well as the restoration of the DU Spokane County track. That was all placed under a, a recreation conservation office proposal. And we were successful in securing 473,000. I should mention um, this was a collaborative effort. This was not Ducks Unlimited doing this. This was very much reliant on a wide partnership. Uh, they included Spokane County, the Land Conservancy, a private landowner, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and you can't do these things without that uh, collaboration, without that partnership. So we got nearly a half a million dollars to do this important work from RCO. And it was not an easy process, I won't lie. It was very time consuming. Um, and, and fairly involved, but uh, it was worth it by all means. Um, Spokane County Environmental Services is part of their, the first larger project that I talked to, talked to you about. We used some of the work that they were doing there as match toward the RCO grant. That was really critical. Many of these grant sources require match. And so Spokane County stepped up and said, hey, we'll put the, the work that we're doing and the cost of that is matched toward uh, this RCO grant to get additional funds. Um, Ducks Unlimited was able to secure some other grant funds to purchase that 60 acres. And then we're donating in-kind services, uh, engineering work, uh, biology time, um, uh, other things to uh, contribute to, uh, to all these projects. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service contributed $22,000 $22, to the DU Spokane Conservation or uh, County Parcel uh, to do some of the revegetation there. Uh, the private landowner is donating uh, nursery material that he's growing out uh, for the easement restoration. Um, he's a nursery operator, so he's growing the materials and providing all the labor to install the trees and shrubs on those rep riparian areas. And um, just fantastic, the landowner would step up in that way. It was really, really, really cool. Uh, and then, of course, the Land Conservancy is doing all the work related to the easement. Um, and much of that will be covered by the RCO grant, but they'll also contribute 
staff time in negotiating and developing uh, the easement documents and getting those secured. So there's been much uh, broader support beyond what I just mentioned. I mean, the local community has just been fantastic. Uh, everybody has been very positive about what's going on out there. Uh, the Central Valley School District, which owns property just immediately adjacent to the flat, uh, is working with Spokane County uh, to in, to locate the interpretive center that, that Todd mentioned earlier. So um, there's a very good possibility that will actually end up on Central Valley School District land. Um, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Spokane Audubon, the Intermountain West Joint Venture, all provided letters of support for this, to, for the RCO grant and have been very involved in the process. So um, it's just been a phenomenal broad base of support for this effort. And it really means a, a huge difference in making these things happen. So uh, my hat's off to everybody that's done their part. And um, lastly, I wanna leave you with who benefits from this. And I can't fit all of the pictures on the screen that of the critters that will benefit. There's been a lot of research done on wetlands and the number of species that use wetlands and the number is around 900 species is, is kind of the consistent number so over 900 species of wildlife uh, will use wetlands at one point or another so we're going to see a, obviously a tremendous increase in the number of water birds of all kinds from shorebirds wading birds secret of marsh birds waterfowl uh, of all shapes and sizes there's a nesting pair of bald eagles already adjacent to the flat. Uh, and I would not be surprised if that number increases. Uh, and maybe we even have more than one pair at some point in the future. But certainly the pair that's there now will benefit tremendously uh, from all of the prey items that will, will use the flats in the future, uh, as well as other raptors that prey on some of these bird species and, and rodents and other prey items that will be there. Uh, Big game, we have white-tailed deer here and now. We had a herd of about 20 elk um, earlier this year in March come down onto the flats, uh, really exciting. I anticipate as the, the habitat is fully developed and we have a lot more uh, for them to forage on, they will be down more regularly. Um, I'm hoping we see a moose at some point. They're certainly in the area and I think we will, we will definitely see them at some point. Uh, but the number of, of critters that are, are going to be seen out there are just going to go up and up. I really firmly believe that. Amphibians are the other group. Uh, you know, amphibians are definitely a group of concern. And uh, any opportunity to restore amphibian habitat is a, is a really uh, great opportunity because worldwide amphibians are really taken hard from a lot of the, the climate change impact that we're seeing. So um, that's really it, folks. Um, I'm happy to answer the questions at the end. I think Todd is kind of queued up. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Chris. That was uh, very, very interesting. Um, I learned a few new things. And I've been around this project for uh, a little over a year now. So if we could, let's transition to a few questions from uh, folks that are in on the call. Uh, and here's the first one. Uh, how do we maximize wildlife protection for this area while encouraging recreation? It's a really good question. Thanks for sending that in. What do you think, Chris? You know, it really, it really is. And, it, and it's one that uh, many uh, resource agencies have to deal with is balancing multiple use. Um, and, and I would say in the, the case of the flats, the county has already done a really great job by trying to locate the trails around the periphery uh, of the wetland. It, Consistent disturbance in the same places. Uh, in other words, they will adapt around disturbances like people riding by on their bike or walking by on a trail. Um, if folks will stay on the trail, there's enough area, there's a, a large enough area there in the flats where a lot of these animals will find the quiet places and they will learn to live within those areas uh, far enough from human disturbance that um, they can go about their lives. Um, if, you know, if we don't regulate access to some level, uh, if we don't, if we don't prevent people from going just wherever they want, it becomes much more problematic. Um, so I certainly think there's a, a plenty of room for, uh, lots of access at the site on the trails that were developed. 
and still have those areas in the non-disturbance zones that those wildlife will continue to use as long as, again, that, that's predictable. Uh, like us, they don't like unpredictability. So, And there's been a lot of research around this subject, everything from large animals to, you know, ungulates to uh, birds. Uh, they have their comfort zone, just like we do. And if you're outside of that comfort zone, they're fine. Uh, if you get, you know, if you get within within that, they, they really get nervous and, and, and won't use the, the area anymore. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it, uh, I like uh, the idea of people staying on trails. That uh, makes us all, makes the animals and the humans uh, coexist better. Uh, the next question is, in addition to the bird habitat that this project will help restore, can you specifically describe the benefit for other critters, things like elk possibly? <laughs> well, as I mentioned, I think the, the number of species is just gonna be tremendous. Um, elk and other large animals, large ungulates, uh, you know, they're very sensitive to human disturbance. So oftentimes what happens with them is they're nocturnal in activity. So when we're out on the trails in the day, they may be up in the forest or in denser areas of vegetation, um, hiding and sleeping. Um, and so we may not always see them, but then at night, the guard shifts and, you know, they're out roaming around doing what they like to do. And we're at all at home sleeping. So um, they find a way, I think, I certainly think we're going to see benefits to all these large ungulates like elk. And I, and I really hope they show up because I just think that it's so cool to see a herd of elk out on, on the flat. So yes, I would say absolutely. Right, right. Um, this last question uh, is a great, uh, you know, hit question because it, it reminds me of, uh, of you know, my days as a history major. A thousand years ago, Chris, what were the flocks of mig migrating birds looking like out on the Southeast Flats, then probably Southeast Lake? Well, if you've ever read about the passenger pigeon, they talk about the historical accounts talk about literally single flocks of passenger pigeons in the tens of millions, try and imagine that, that would, that would fly over the central part of the country in the Midwest for days. It would take days for these migrating flocks to go over. Um, and I'm certain that many of these waterfowl species and other water birds had similar populations. Um, we know that wetland habitat is absolutely crucial to a lot of these water birds and determines their population density. And we know in many areas of the country, the wetland loss has been tremendous. In, in the case of California, they've lost 90% of their historical wetlands. The Central Valley of California, uh, prior to, to settlement by Europeans, was, was essentially one large wetland. Um, that was dynamic, but uh, when you lose that amount of, of critical habitat for any species, you're going to lose the population. So although waterfowl populations, for example, are at all time recently at all time high since surveys began in the 1950s, we can just, we know for sure that with all of the loss of wetlands, these populations were much, much larger before we started counting them and historically. So I think the birds blacken the skies over Salty Flats historically. And while we may never quite see that again, um, I think we will certainly see snippets of that from time to time. Hey, two great questions just popped up in the chat. So I'm gonna throw these at you too, if you don't mind. Uh, first one is, is the, is the entire area of the historic lake uh, hope to be targeted for land acquisition conservation? Not currently. Uh, that area that was south of the dike, uh, that large dike kind of on the, the, the southern third of, of the flats that I mentioned, there's a, a lot of uh, small land ownership south of there. Uh, we're talking 10, 15 acre parcels. There may be as many as 15 or 20 of those in that area. Anytime you're dealing with that many folks, uh, and by and large, that area is natural. It's not, the wetland there is not functioning at a very high level. Um, it's sort of overgrown with, with cattails and bulrush, um, so it's not very diverse, but given, you know, the alternative, it could be much worse. It could pro provide much less habitat. And so because of the complications of the land ownership um, and the current state of that site, I don't anticipate any real concerted effort to do land acquisition there. It's just not going to have the payout 
Um, however, there are some private land holdings within the area north of the dike. And in those areas, I think whether through easements or other fee title acquisitions, I think there'd be an opportunity uh, to expand the footprint of the lake, essentially the restored lake, by having more of that land uh, uh, you know, under a conservation purpose. Okay, uh, and there's one question in the chat that I think is on everyone's mind, and it has to do with mosquitoes. What is the impact uh, to the mosquitoes uh, with all the standing water nearby to folks' homes and, and the community? Believe it or not, that is another reason why having seasonal water is a really great thing because mosquitoes don't like dynamic water. They like stagnant, small bodies of water. Well, we don't really have a lot of small bodies of water within the flat until that wetland is draining down. And typically that's gonna be in the late spring, early uh, and the areas that remain are going to be large open water areas or large bodies of water independently. And that's not where mosquitoes actually like to live. They actually like to live in your old tires in your yard, the water that collects in those and the buckets and the old potting containers. Um, they, re <laughs> they really don't like these big natural wetlands. The other thing about these wetlands is they harbor a lot of mosquito eating insects. So dragonflies and uh, water boatmen and some of the other bugs that live in these wetlands, actually one of their primary sources of food is mosquito larva. So it's a, a common misconception that wetlands bring mosquitoes and really a healthy wetland that's functioning properly does not, by and large. Great, great. Um, well, thank you so much that for your presentation. It does help. It does help. I, you know, I recreating out there. I don't ever feel like I'm being eaten alive by mosquitoes. So uh, it seems to be working. It's, no, you know, it's not a buggy. And place since we've been here, yeah, and since we've been living here, I can honestly say I have not been bitten by one mosquito. So uh, it's it's a very nice thing. Don't tell the mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, they're all coming to get you now. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, tonight, Chris. Unfortunately, we're we're running low on time. Um, so I want to thank everyone for making time and, and uh, out in your evening and, and taking part in this. I hope it was uh, educational, informative, and uh, kind of in inspirational to know that, you know, a decade uh, long amount of work from multiple organizations and agencies uh, is coming to fruition. So thank you so much. Um, we're excited to be able to share projects like this with you, and we, we love all of you who are on the call who are supporters. Thank you so much for your support. And if these kind of projects are new to you, if you're just hearing about it for the first time, we welcome you to become supporters so that we can continue doing this work in the Inland Northwest. Um, thank you all so much for your time, and uh, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did this evening. Our next uh, Zoom with the View will be July 14th, had to get the date right, uh, again, 6 p.m., it's a Tuesday. Um, and we will have our very own Rose Richardson. Uh, he, she's a staff member here at INLC, um, giving a talk about wildfire as we move into further into summer. Uh, we hope that we're not affected by wildfire, but uh, it's, it's an important topic that we learn about and that we uh, you know, continue to discuss and, and talk about. So um, hopefully you can mark your calendar and we will be sending out uh, invites uh, to our email list and, and through Facebook and other social media. So uh, July 14th, 6 p.m., uh, we're gonna be talking about wildfire and maybe a little bit about wildfire smoke. So um, thank you all so much and uh, have a good evening. Mike. We can unmute mics and everybody can say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, great. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Thank it was you. really good. very much. Good to see your faces. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Rob. Bye, Chris. Looks like I need to take a drive out there.